There's a saying that movies are born three times. Once when you write them, once when you shoot them, and once when you edit them. Each part of the filmmaking process gives a story the opportunity to be seen from a different perspective, as words on the page are then spoken by actors, and then given context by the other sounds and images that surround them. But I think that movies are actually born four times, and the last time is with the audience. Because as audiences, we only spend a few hours at a time with a movie, sometimes never revisiting it again. And rather than the layers of meaning and context that the filmmakers have built up over months or years, our only frame of reference is what we bring into the theater with us. This means that not everyone's going to have the same experience with every movie, that whatever the filmmakers may have intended the movie to say, it's ultimately our own individual reaction to it that matters the most. And this is kind of a long way of saying I don't think the things I'm going to talk about in this video were necessarily intended by the filmmakers, and also that I don't think it matters. Human beings like to find patterns in things and give them meaning. Stars don't intend to form constellations, but people still noticed their shapes and decided to use them to help navigate the world around them. So here's how to navigate Zack Snyder's DCEU trilogy with some things I noticed. First, we need to know a few things about Superman. He wears a blue suit with a red cape, he gets his power from the sun, and he hangs out at the Fortress of Solitude in the Arctic. Pretty basic stuff, but it lays out the foundation of a visual motif that, intentional or not, seems to run throughout all three of Snyder's Superman-adjacent movies. Since Snyder's going for a more mythological take on the DC superhero world, there's a lot of elemental forces at play in his movies, specifically fire and water, and how they relate to the Superman character. First we have fire, usually a destructive force, and it's tied to his red cape, which is referenced by characters who are concerned about the danger Superman poses. The red capes are coming. The red capes are coming. But fire is also connected to the sun, and it's the source of Superman's unearthly power, so it's connected to his home planet of Krypton as well. In contrast, water is tied to Earth and the characters who see him as an ally refer to him as water, or more specifically ice, is also connected to his fortress of solitude, and often comes into play when he's unsure of himself and he needs guidance from his fathers. These motifs are put on display right away in Man of Steel, with the prologue set on the planet Krypton. Depleted of all its natural resources and on the verge of a civil war, Krypton is a dry, desiccated husk, where the red sun looms large and the ground threatens to burst open into pillars of fire. The only water on the planet seems to be contained in the Genesis chambers, seaweed-like clusters of Kryptonian fetuses whose DNA has been predetermined by a skull-like codex. Realizing that the planet is doomed, the scientist Jor-El submerges himself into a Genesis chamber and steals the codex so that he can bond it with his infant son Kal-El's blood, which he hopes will give Krypton a second chance if Kal-El can survive the planet's destruction. We haven't been introduced to Earth yet in the movie, but by having this lingering moment in the water, the movie starts to connect this idea of Kryptonian potential being tied to water, and by extension, the planet Earth. This connection is reinforced when, after the baby Kal-El is launched towards Earth from his doomed home, we don't even see his escape pod make impact. Instead, the movie smash cuts to a fishing boat breaking through a rough wave and introduces us to the adult Clark Kent, just some anonymous guy working on a fishing boat. He doesn't really seem to have his sea legs, though. It's almost as if he doesn't really belong here. This sequence also gives us Clark's first act of heroism in the movie, which requires him to abandon the rough waters of Earth and bathe himself in the fire of Krypton. Of course, the fire here isn't literally Kryptonian in nature, but the destruction of Superman's home planet is explicitly stated to be the result of stripping the planet's natural resources, so making Clark's first enemy in the movie a flaming oil rig seems to be a pretty clear thematic connection. But even though he burns with the power of Krypton, it's a messy rescue, and it's clear that things are still pretty far out of his control. Even when he's trying to help, he's surrounded by danger. So as the fire burns above him, Clark is safe ish in the water below, and we get to the movie's first flashback. This one in particular establishes how Clark relates to both fire and water. He uses his heat vision, presumably for the first time, to isolate himself from the world after a frightening experience as a child. He's an outcast, and the world around him is an immense ocean that threatens to drown him. Just, um, focus on my voice. Pretend it's an island. Out in the ocean. Can you see it? I see it. 
see it. Then swim towards it, honey. Clark knows what drowning feels like, and it's just as dangerous to him as the fires of Krypton are to the people of Earth. And in the present, even when Clark returns to land, it's not even dry land. Following the ordeal on the oil rig, he finds himself in a rainy seaside town where all of his alien strength is of absolutely no use, and the only way for him to get dry clothes is to steal them. This sequence leads us to the movie's second flashback, where a bullying incident aboard a school bus is punctuated by the bus veering off a bridge and plunging into a river. The movie directly connects Clark's anxiety about the immense ocean of the world with actual physical danger here, and it provides an opportunity for him to overcome it. Clark pulling himself and his classmates out of the water also signals the start of his journey to Superman, which his father Jor-El hopes will mean bringing the people of Earth with him into the sun. After learning about his alien origins, the movie returns to the present, where Clark has taken a job at a truck stop bar and overhears a couple of soldiers talking about a mysterious, anomalous object found up north. Even if we couldn't guess that it's Kryptonian in origin, Alison Crowe's cover of Ring of Fire playing in the background should clue us in. When Clark heads to an Arctic military base to investigate, we're also introduced to intrepid reporter Lois Lane, who spots Clark moving cryptid-like towards what we learn is a crashed Kryptonian ship buried deep in the ice. Lois follows Clark into the ship, and although we know Clark is safe, Lois doesn't, only seeing the scars of his fiery heat vision. It turns out that his ability can also be used to help, though, and Clark uses it to cauterize a wound caused by a Kryptonian sentry drone. This isn't really a huge moment in the movie, but as the series goes on, it becomes pretty clear how much of Superman's humanity is tied to his relationship with Lois. After helping her, Clark takes the ship and deposits Lois on an ice floe before investigating it further, and meets a digital ghost of Jor-El, who explains Clark's nature as a child of two worlds, and gives him his suit, which represents this synthesis. The subsequent first flight sequence visually demonstrates the potential of combining both fire and water, sun and ice, red and blue, into the Superman character. After this sequence, the movie transitions from focusing on the water motif to focusing on fire, as General Zod arrives and the Kryptonian threat becomes more tangible. And it's not just that the second half of the movie has more explosion-filled action sequences, though it does. When the alien Superman turns himself into the US government, he does so at a barren desert base. And when he surrenders himself to Zod, the dreamy confrontation between the two shows the desolate fate that awaits Earth if Zod is allowed to resurrect Krypton there. Once the movie's third act begins, Superman has two major challenges. The first is the Kryptonian's terraforming world engine, which has landed in the Indian Ocean and is belching smoke and fire into the air as it destroys the planet's natural beauty. This thematically serves as Clark's rematch against the oil rig from earlier in the movie. And when he eventually does defeat it, then he has to face his second challenge in General Zod. If the terraforming machine represents the danger of Earth becoming like Krypton, then Zod is the potential for Clark to end up like the Kryptonians. Both within the movie and in comic book history, Heat Vision has been established as the big scary alien Superman power. So it's appropriate that when Clark has to decide whether or not Krypton deserves a second chance, Heat Vision is the weapon Zod uses to prove that it doesn't. But Clark isn't the only one that Zod's power affects. Moving into Batman v Superman, Zod's Heat Vision is also the catalyst for Bruce Wayne to begin his crusade against the alien menace of Superman. During the battle in Metropolis, Wayne watches impotently as Zod effortlessly carves up his skyscraper, and he races into the dry, choking dust to try to save anyone who might be alive afterwards. And when he sees Zod and Superman hurtling towards the Earth amidst a rain of fire, the moment crystallizes him into the Batman we see for the rest of the movie. And like the end of Man of Steel's prologue, this imagery of fire and destruction is contrasted with the waters of Earth. Only this time, we see calm blue ocean in the aftermath of Superman's actions. The movie's telling us that Bruce Wayne's perspective is only a part of the picture, and that Superman did indeed save the world. But even calm water isn't always safe. This sequence in the Indian Ocean introduces kryptonite via images that replicate the Genesis chambers from Man of Steel. This gives kryptonite a lot of symbolic weight because now it's not just a radioactive rock, now it represents the danger of Zod's version of Krypton growing out of the Earth itself. From there, we return to the dry, dusty, and dangerous, where Lois is trying to interview an African warlord but is taken hostage thanks to the efforts of the eternally unlucky Jimmy Olsen. This whole thing is eventually revealed to be a trap set by Lex Luthor using Lois as a bait to lure Superman and using his henchmen to incinerate the bodies of the people they've killed in order to make it seem like Superman burned them with his alien heat vision. 
After this incident, Lois returns home to Metropolis on a rainy day and draws herself a bath, which Clark eventually joins. Since Superman's love for Earth is represented by his love for Lois, the movie very strongly connects her to water. Her subplot in the movie follows her as she tries to identify the source of the bullets used by the mercenaries in Africa, which can help to clear Superman's name. In the process, she seeks out the aid of General Swanwick, meeting with him on rainy city streets, at a riverside bench, even in a men's washroom as she unravels the mystery of who on earth would try to frame Superman. Lois hopes that Superman is fundamentally good, while Bruce, who fearfully broods in a dark cave under a lake, can only see an alien enemy. Bruce is blind to Superman's humanity, but it's specifically that humanity that allows Clark Kent to do things that Superman can't. So when Clark sees a woman on TV who's claiming that Superman is responsible for the death of her family and asks to look him in the eye so he can explain himself, he obliges her. But not as Superman. Instead, Clark Kent crosses the water from Metropolis to Gotham in the hopes of speaking to her as a human being. And although he doesn't get the chance, the decision does alert him to Batman's new brutality, which Clark later learns is leaving children orphaned. Clark's investigations are then contrasted with Bruce Wayne's search for a criminal known as the White Portuguese. While Clark knows how important his human side is, Bruce, in his lakefront glass house, is frustrated that his work as Batman has been unsuccessful and needs Alfred to remind him that the man underneath the mask is still important presenting him with an invitation to a charity fundraiser hosted by Lex Luthor, who is Wayne's primary suspect. Clark is also invited to the fundraiser as a reporter, and witnesses Lex give a rambling speech that starts with a reference to Prometheus being punished for stealing the god's fire on humanity's behalf. After the speech, Clark only sticks around long enough to briefly meet Bruce Wayne before being made aware of a disaster in progress. The montage that follows from Superman tending to the emergency heavily focuses on imagery of fire, water, sun, and ice. The televised debates about Superman's nature are contextualized by these elemental images and what we've seen of his journey so far. The other largely symbolic sequence in the film is Batman's Nightmare, where he glimpses a destroyed, post-apocalyptic version of Earth burning with pillars of fire ruled by a tyrannical, red-eyed Superman. After waking up, Bruce tracks down the true identity of the white Portuguese he's been chasing, and it turns out to be a boat carrying kryptonite, which is the only earthly defense against the Superman. Traveling to the docks, Batman chases the truck carrying the kryptonite, but wet streets turn to fire as Superman intervenes and warns Batman to hang up the cowl. This only serves to enrage Batman further, though, and after making some impotent threats, he returns to his damp cave to plot his next steps. Following this, Superman arrives at a Senate hearing to answer for his alleged actions in Africa and in Metropolis two years earlier. After he arrives, the hearing briefly stumbles thanks to a jar of Lex Luthor's piss, a childish threat that, while it does connect Lex Luthor to humanity, also reinforces him as being a disgusting cringe weirdo. Specifically, the type of disgusting cringe weirdo who puts a bomb in a wheelchair. Once again, fire is used to cast doubt on Superman, and this is the tipping point that causes Bruce Wayne to steal Luthor's stash of kryptonite. And although people within the movie quickly determine that Superman wasn't directly responsible, he doesn't need to be. As Lex says in his Philosophy 101 lecture later in the movie, God is all-powerful. He cannot be all-good. And if he is all-good, then he cannot be all-powerful. All he needs is for the people of Earth to realize that at least one of those things is true, and they'll stop believing in Superman. The first person to do so is Superman himself, and Clark retreats into solitude on a snowy mountaintop where he encounters a vision of his father Jonathan. Appropriately, Jonathan recounts the story of a flood that nearly destroyed the Kent family farm when he was a boy, and how his supposed heroism in helping to reroute the water away from his home only caused the destruction of a neighbor's farm instead. It's a bleak story that seems to confirm Clark's thoughts about the futility of Superman, but when he asks whether Jonathan ever stopped hearing the screams of drowning horses in his nightmares, he says, Yeah. When I met your mother, she gave me faith that there's good in this world. She was my world. For Clark, Lois is his world, made apparent by her connection to water. She is now the island he can focus on when the ocean of Earth becomes too large for him to handle. And pretty soon it's going to become hard to handle as Batman lights his signal amidst a torrential downpour, challenging the man from Krypton to face the best humanity has to offer. 
But Superman isn't just going to fight Batman for the fun of it. Using the island of Lois as bait, Lex lures Superman back to Metropolis and tells him to kill Batman in exchange for his Martha's life. And in the reign of Gotham, Superman attempts to reason with Batman. But Bruce has murder on his mind and forces the fight, which has some interesting elemental storytelling going on. Out in the rain, Superman is caught by surprise by Batman's traps, but he gains the upper hand when he unleashes Kryptonian fire. The advantage eventually wanes as they spend more time in the storm, and Batman gasses Superman with kryptonite and tackles him into an abandoned train station. Only when they're inside and out of the rain does the gas wear off, and Superman once again gets the upper hand until Batman hits him with a second grenade and finishes the fight inside the station's leaky washroom, eventually knocking him out by smashing a sink on his head and dumping him onto a pit full of damp radiators. With the fight over, Batman grabs his kryptonite spear and prepares to kill Superman, a moment that also vaguely ties into the element of motifs of the movie. It's no secret that these movies lean into religious imagery, and in this movie, Batman is cast as Longinus, who some Christian traditions say was a blind Roman soldier who pierced Christ's flesh with his spear, and whose eyes were healed when the blood and water from the wound fell into them. And that's basically what happens here, only instead of his physical sight being restored, he has an epiphany and realizes that he's become just like his own parents' killer after Superman utters Thomas Wayne's dying words and triggers Bruce's PTSD. Blood and water are also combined by Lex Luthor, who baptizes Zod's corpse and combines it with his own blood to create the Doomsday Abomination. And while that's cooking, Batman heads off to rescue Clark's mother by playing through an Arkham Asylum challenge mission on New Game Plus, and it's actually a pretty cathartic scene for him. After failing to save his parents from getting killed by a random thug, and then failing to save his employees from fiery destruction, he finally gets a chance to save Martha from a random thug wielding a flamethrower. Meanwhile, Superman confronts Luthor as Doomsday is born, and the big third act action sequence kicks off. For both Superman and Batman, Doomsday serves as the physical manifestation of the Kryptonian threat, and because of that, the nuclear fire that the US government brings to bear against it only makes the creature stronger. Even the last minute intervention of Wonder Woman isn't quite enough to turn the tide. To kill the creature made by man to kill God, they'll need a weapon designed for the same purpose, one that Lois had previously thrown into a flooded section of the abandoned train station. As she tries to retrieve it, the battle makes the structure collapse, trapping her underwater. Superman manages to save her and then dives in himself to retrieve the spear, nearly drowning in the process. So as Wonder Woman and Batman work to hold the creature still, Superman reenacts his favorite scene from Excalibur and defeats Doomsday at the cost of his own life. Unfortunately, Space Jesus doing a murder-suicide on the devil is so mythologically powerful in this world that it awakens a trio of ancient alien artifacts hidden on Earth which signal to their master that the planet is ripe for conquest. And as we get into Zack Snyder's Justice League, the fire and water elemental motifs get kind of muddled. Since they mostly revolve around Superman, and he's dead for most of the movie, that's bound to happen, but there are still a few moments where these themes do get to continue. When Bruce Wayne begins his search for people to help him fight against the incoming alien threat, he starts out investigating an Icelandic fishing village. At the beginning of the movie, he's kind of lost without Superman, but like Superman did when he needed answers or guidance, Bruce heads to the Arctic. And it's there that he meets Aquaman, who doesn't really have much to do with the water as earth motif that's been established, but Arthur Curry in this movie is actually fairly similar to where Clark was at the beginning of Man of Steel, a drifter who's caught between two worlds and is ultimately compelled to help those in need. The next time the water motif shows up is when the movie reintroduces us to Lois, who maintains a vigil at the rainy site of Superman's memorial. And since there's no living Kryptonians, Justice League transfers the danger of fire to Steppenwolf and the villains of Apocalypse. Starting with the Han and Carbonite inspired molten metal obelisks they communicate through, and the flame belching ships they use in the Age of Heroes flashback. Even Wonder Woman's journey to discover this lost history is prompted by a mystical fire created by the Amazons after Steppenwolf steals their mother box. That doesn't mean that fire is completely dissociated from Superman though. The Justice League's decision to attempt to resurrect him is compared to burning down a house and then turning the smoke from the fire back into the house. As the movie tells us with a lingering shot on Superman's holographic red cape, there's still a danger there. Nevertheless, it's their best option, and they come up with a plan that involves baptizing Superman's body in the same Kryptonian chamber that created Doomsday, in a sequence that places a lot of focus on the photo Clark was buried with of his father as a fisherman. The plan works, kind of. The Kryptonian ship resurrects Kal-El, but not Clark. Kal-El isn't as violent as Doomsday, but he's still capable of plenty of destruction, and the battle that breaks out is only halted by the arrival of Lois, who helps to resurrect Clark when she returns with him to the Kent farm, at least temporarily. 
In the Justice League sequel Snyder had outlined while developing his films, he wanted Superman to begin to lose touch with his human side after being resurrected, which would be one of the things that made him susceptible to Darkseid's anti-life mind control. To represent this, he had Superman choose a black suit during his return to the Kryptonian ship, which is more in line with the suits worn by Zod and the other Kryptonians in Man of Steel. Although he's guided in the sequence by the voices of both his earthly and Kryptonian fathers, he's lost the synthesis he achieved the first time he put on the suit, and won't regain it again for some time. And this uncertainty is, oddly enough, tied into the first appearance of Superman's last major power, his icy super breath. The uncertainty that's common to his visits to the Arctic is now internalized and is sure to have consequences down the road. Maybe. We have no idea if Zack Snyder's Justice League is going to exist beyond the glimpses peppered throughout the existing trilogy, but as long as we're reading way too much into things, there is one motif that's hidden throughout the series that I believe is the key to understanding everything. And that motif is, of course, the hot dog truck. During the Smallville battle in Man of Steel, a mysterious hot dog truck is seen racing through the streets of the town, either oblivious of or impervious to the effects of the battle going on around it. Obviously, Barry Allen, who exists outside of time, knows the truth about the hot dog truck. What does the hot dog truck know, and who are its masters? If you've seen this truck before, post in the comments. It is an evil, odious thing, and must be brought to justice. And only together can the whole world become a Justice League and figure out what the fuck is going on in these movies. 